So first up, we have uh, Vladimir Wu from Integrated Computer Solutions, uh, talking to you about QML tips, uh, tricks, and treats. Thank you. Actually, yes. Yes. Tricks and treats. So the Halloween is coming, so it's our topic. Well, <laughs> uh, so this talk is aimed at no ways or no ways to intermediate QML developers, and we are covering this topics or sections. Firstly, we are touching on the issues of structured and mixed QML C++ applications, uh, and specifically on the issues of properly importing QML from resources. Then we touch the problems of QML language scope and name lookup, a topic which is rarely actually covered uh, both by blogs and uh, videos and uh, dev day sessions. And then we will cover some practical aspects, like, for example, probably the hottest topic here is creating custom views. For example, you have a list view, and you would like to add a scroll bar to it, uh, and then you find out that you just, well, you can crash it with <laughs> some uh, content width, uh, content height, uh, content Y, and X manipulations, but you can't have your honest, good old, um, nice scroll bar. And the solution is uh, to write your own view. And, and it proves quite simple, actually, as we will see. Then we will be touching keyboard and mouse handling issues, and one quite funny, actually, approach to starting QML applications in the end of the session. So speaking of uh, setting up one's mixed C++ QML projects, let's imagine you have something which actually spans across several sub-projects. For example, you have several applications. Uh, some of them are QML. Some of them are, uh, well, widgets having uh, an embedded or, uh, well, parented uh, quick window container. So, some are libraries. And you would like to have a very simplistic and natural workflow uh, since you have cloned the actual source tree. So you would like to basically QMake and build. And upon making any changes to any of the projects, you would like to basically hit Control-B in Creator and have all the libraries properly rebuilt, everything relinked, copied to where it actually belongs, and when actually be able to run all of your apps. Let's see what I have probably not covered. So other issues are the issues of being still platform specific. So QMake gives you a nice abstraction over, well, the differences between diff different platforms. But sometimes, for example, with uh, <laughs> DSDIR or DLL DSDIR, the actual shape of this uh, slashes matters, as it turns out. And for example, we all know that uh, .lib versus .a also matters when you have to watch your libraries for changes. So you have to write, write some conditional code here. Then the dependency between libraries is something which is probably addressed quite fine with the usual uh, dependency tracking means of QMake. But in uh, well, in case when you have those mixed QML, C++, pure QML, uh, and maybe some QML modules and C++ only um, sets of projects, sometimes it turns out that it's more natural to use some custom solution here and not rely on the built-in means. And then the most interesting topic here is shipping proper QML models in, in resources. So this is the topic actually covered, well, touched uh, by quite many, I believe, pages on Qt Project Org. And <laughs> I haven't probably seen one proper solution there, I believe. So the first problem here is that organizing QML sources in proper modules, that is the modules which you import by name, like import my module uh, 1.0, is easy when they all reside on disk. And you are running your, again, residing on disk QML files from within the QML scene. And thus, the modules are naturally accessible. But let's imagine you have that application which actually has the modules in resources. And here the problems actually start to happen. Then there is the problem of uh, getting 
your plugin libraries actually <laughs> properly accessed from within uh, the QML, both residing in the resources and also on disk. On disk. And then there is the problem of properly addressing various audio, video, and image assets your QML modules may, may contain. So the usual tricks here are to import something relative with the double dot slash and so on, or even use QRC path specification in QML. Or point to assets again directly with the QRC URL. But the problem here would be that <laughs> this would sort of preclude uh, using the same modules when you're running your uh, QML files from within QML scene, right? Because if you're referencing <laughs> cute resources, then you are out of the game with the plain old uh, QML files residing on disk. And the solutions here are firstly access everything uh, via relative paths, import all modules by name, sort of following the now standard Qt, uh, and QML practice. Then properly set up uh, import paths within the QML project file, or maybe add appropriate uh, slash i and uh, slash p parameters when running QML scene in the Qt creator um, projects tab for the QML scene. Then you would have to properly reference all your plugin libraries in QML Deer and uh, make sure that they actually get copied to a specific folder where they will be easily found. Then you basically put all your QML uh, files, the whole modules, assets, and QML Deer files themselves into application resources and call these two methods. So you add import paths and plugin paths, and it works. What you should care about is that if you are on Linux, you can actually put your um, plugin libraries in some other modules, or oh, sorry, in some other uh, folders, and this will also work. But on Windows, you will uh, have to take care about the search paths for the libraries. So the easy solution here is to just put everything in a bin folder. And let's look how it actually works in a setup we use. So here is a generic QML project for Qt5. It consists of several libraries, some static, some shared. They actually depend one upon each other, forming some sort of dependency tree. It may have one or several applications. And it also may contain some uh, C++ QML modules, which also may contain some pure QML, by the way. So for example, here is an app. Here we have the usual Qt plus equals, headers, sources, resources, and then two custom variables. So we do some nice <laughs> you make work in the background. We basically specify two variables for the dependencies of this specific module or application. And these are the names of the folders within the project tree. And the trick, or maybe a trick here, is that the project tree is quite rigid. And this allows us to, uh, well, write uh, or generate all the uh, QMake sources or uh, properly set up QMake variables, I should say, in quite an easy manner. So here we basically include something named app PRI, which is a PRI file residing in the folder where the applications are stored. You basically include it in every project file for every application you create. And it does the following. So it takes care of uh, the slashes. It also properly takes care of the clean issues because, for example, as it turns out, sometimes uh, there are some problems with properly cleaning up libraries, for example, on Windows. So 
the clean uh, step runs, but the libraries are still there. So it turns out that the make files generated by QMake <laughs> are a little bit broken, unless you properly play with the slashes. And here we account for this. Then there is some nice Linux or Unix specific trickery going with the air path and origin specification, which allows us to properly link to libraries uh, to which our application or maybe a library uh, should link. And depends in terms of this syntax. And we will speak about this, I believe, in a minute. And then there's the last file, which is, as it names, name actually suggests, common between uh, the PRI include files for applications and shared and static libraries and human plugins. It does some imperative, imperative working through the dependencies you specified here. For example, here we have dependencies shared, shared one, shared two, and shared one and shared two will be folders on disk containing the shared libraries you have. So here we have the libs variable properly stuffed. <laughs> and then the same thing happens with depend static. Here, pre-target depths are properly accounted for. And this is also platform specific. Let's return to the slides. So this speaks exactly about this. These are uh, the usual variables you deal with when writing your uh, QMake profiles includes. They include search paths for the compiler. They govern the actual search paths uh, which will be passed to GCC, like for example in GCC's case uh, slash large E. Then depend paths again uh, something related to the includes, but this time something governing whether the make files will have some uh, conditional logic watching for the changes of the includes. So let's imagine you have a project and another project and there is inclusion of some headers. So you made a change to the headers. In the, let's say, first project, you hit Control-B and nothing happens, but uh, the second project logically should have been rebuilt. So for this to happen, depend paths sort of should be used. And we automate this in our setup. So this happens, let me go back. This happens here, target depth, depend path, yeah. So we probably already covered the tricks. And speaking of the tricks, yes, the solution is to have a rigid folder structure for your sub project project. And again, this is a QMake, ah, sorry, sub dirs project. And it goes like this. So we have those common PRI and the generic, well, the topmost project file we have just seen. Then there is the bin folder where all the applications and shared libraries actually end up. And then we have folders, ah, yes, one folder for the libraries, for the static libraries, and then we have fol folders for the actual sources. Just for convenience, they are separated uh, into app for the applications, the compiled applications, then modules, uh, actually go into something named module. And here we have shared and static modules and appropriate, again, PRI include files, which allow us to write code like this. Let me see, plugin module. For example, here, shared one. Again, this is simple. It depends on, on shared two, but to specify, the, to, sorry, to specify the dependency, you only have to have these two lines here and you will get target depths, includes, and whatever, just for free, together with proper cleaning up and so on. Then there's the folder for QML. And here we have both 
pure QML applications, for example, something to test to test our QML modules res res residing here, and the actual modules, which can be pure QML or mixed C++ QML. For example, this module here, again, the project file syntax follows the same pattern. We have those where the depends share, depends static, and a specific include file, API file, uh, for the plugin modules. And this one is for QML2, and it's, it's trivial to write one for QML1. And the PRI actually contains something like this. So it's the usual stuff you, you, you would have in your profile for a QML C++ plugin. Again, a little bit of trickery, especially these tricks should be noted, but then it's quite clean. Okay, probably one more topic to cover. Yes, this one was probably passed. So, what happens if you have some logic in a C++ library, or let's say some logic uh, <laughs> you would like to share between uh, a plugin and maybe a C++ application. So the first thing actually coming to mind is to basically have a static library. Sorry. Where is it? Here. Because static library. But this uh, may end up uh, with uh, the same object called actually linked twice, both into your application and your uh, C++ QML plugin, which will cause the usual and well-known errors. Or maybe you will have to drag <laughs> where you created your objects and then delete them in that very specific place. And that's, as well, as I've heard about, is like something you probably ha sometimes have on Windows with the uh, Windows Microsoft Compiler standard library linked twice, for example, once to the application and the second time to the library you wrote, or a library you sort of got from someone. And then you have those horrors of properly specifying the uh, compile and build parameters like slash mt, slash md, and then you sometimes get errors once again, and someone actually ends up uh, suggesting that you should probably do it right and track uh, where you actually create your objects and then delete them in those specific places and you end up uh, actually tracking your <laughs> std strings and so on and that's pure hell actually so a natural thing uh, which doesn't even require uh, any advanced uh, linkers loaders or whatever knowledge is to basically share the code you would like to share in the shared library and after all that's what Q does with its stock items right they all reside in the library, and that very library actually uh, gets linked, or your, your code gets linked to it from within both your plugins and your C++, C++, C++ applications. So, for example, when you are writing your C++ QML module, a QML plugin, <laughs> you have access to the binary interface of a QQQ item, right? And then you have this very same access uh, from the new C++ application when you get a pointer to an instance, for example, uh, of your root object. That's natural. But there is a dependency of two modules on or <coughs> an application and the library on the same object code. They both link to. So the, the proper way here is once again to share the code you would like to share in a shared library. And this can trivially be done, be done with QML as well, so you just put uh, the code you would like to share in the library, and then you, once again, could use the trick where you, or maybe not actually the trick, I, I actually believe this is the, the proper way to deal with it. You could put the code into your library and, well, specify the dependencies for both applications and libraries, depending on it, and then just use the code from all of them without worrying about any linkage or uh, properly de deleting objects where they actually were created issues. Let's go further. So the next topic 
is something indeed quite rarely covered uh, by the QML tutorials. The official docs do have some relevant links. We have them at the end of the section, here, there, and the slides will be, I believe, soon available on the internet. But to properly get uh, <laughs> the idea of what happens there, I believe you need quite some investigation to do. And the problem is without getting correct what is actually going on there, you can't be quite confident uh, that your QML actually works as it should. Of course, <laughs> you could simplify this or maybe impose a coding standard, which I know is sometimes done, which almost, well, precludes using any advanced uh, scoping or name lookup mechanisms. And then you should actually, of course, test and hope that it actually works and never breaks. But the thing is, the topic isn't uh, very hard to get. Uh, it's just that it's sort of not quite well covered by the official documentation. So here is what we done internally at ICS. There are the docs. Something is on Stack Overflow. You can get some ideas from uh, the code of the standard QML items, like especially repeater and list view, more or less simplistic ones. And then, of course, you should experiment. We actually presented this to the well wider audience last Thursday, and the session will be soon on the internet again. And the most important insights are here. So firstly, what do we have in the C++ and QML lens? So firstly, there is Qt object, and everyone knows that it's the old good Q object, and not necessarily visual. Then there is item, the root, <laughs> and the ancestor of all the visual QML items. Then we have a component, which is uh, either an inline component or when you import something, well, an instance of a component or specifically quick component item created by the QML runtime for you. And then the document is plainly a string residing on disk. So let's look at those in sources. Give me a second. Here, there. So here we have items, which again are Q object in the old, uh, old <laughs> object orientation sense of is a relationship. We have an inline component definition, which specifies again this item. What else? We can have component type properties, by the way. And we can instantiate firstly the components themselves imperatively, and then use uh, those instances then to create actual objects or maybe items, if the component specifies a visual item. Or you can use an inline component definition and just create an object with a single line. Now, here comes an interesting topic <laughs> and probably one of the most important things actually to remember about uh, the QML objects. So firstly, C++ uh, Q object parent child trees are different from uh, the QML, what they call visual parent child trees. So a Q, a Q quick items parent is quite a different thing from Q object parent. And the hierarchies are different. And you, I believe you probably could create a weird example where something is a child uh, in uh, key object parents in terms and a parent of its own child, well, the other way around in uh, QML terms. So the hierarchies are different. And this is the most important thing here probably. They are different and the lifetime is also sort of tracked differently. But we will cover this in a minute. So then, 
speaking of QML site objects, which are again Q, Q objects, they are normally garbage collected by the QML engine. And this is fine. Also, as the notes in the green note below says, sorry, you can actually specify whether the specific Q object instance is actually garbage collected and managed by the QML engine or not with some special methods. Sometimes this is handy, but generally a uh, heuristic can be used. Then there are JavaScript objects, and they are managed by the JavaScript runtime. So we got actually like three lens. Uh, Q objects living on the C++ side, let's say not QML related at all, right? And those are, uh, and the lifetime of those is actually governed by the usual, well, imperative means you create them, you delete them, or maybe use uh, the mechanisms provided by the key object parent mechanism, right? The parent dies, the children get deleted before it. Okay, then there is the QML land, almost the same key uh, objects, but this time they are actually <laughs> uh, garbage collected, normally at least. Then in the QML land, there live JavaScript objects managed by the JavaScript runtime. And then there is the thing without the name. I put it here so, uh, both for reference and also so sort of for laughs because it's strange and it's nameless. So quoting the docs variable or var in QML2 properties are not QML objects and not JavaScript objects either. What they are, so that's my question <laughs> to the <laughs> trolls probably. Now let's go a little bit further. Okay, and here is sort of uh, a cheat list on the name lookup. Basically, these are the rules uh, allowing you to be sure which specific name will be found when you have it in binding or in your imperative code. And let's <coughs> firstly go for a small quiz style example. So here we have this. So everyone sees the font, or actually can I probably make it larger. Hope the size is okay. So we have three nested items, nested in terms of, well, declarativity, <laughs> on-screen geometry, and the fact that uh, upon creation, we will have a QML visual parent child, uh, effectively not even a tree, but a chain. Right? Grandpa, parent, and the small one. And here in component of, on completed uh, of the innermost item, we firstly call the F function here, and then output whatever name is, or let me say whatever name binds to. So speaking of the F function, this is obvious, and JavaScript locals shadow whatever is up there uh, in any scope chains. So F will give us local. And then the question is, what we will get here from the second console log? Because we have <coughs> name both here and here. So if you guys are up to it, you can actually make suggestions on what will happen and why. Maybe someone actually knows, because this, look, this is <laughs> the most basic stuff, right? <laughs> and still it's not, I believe, covered quite well by the docs. And lots of people can get tricked by the issues like this. And there are more issues. So does anyone has an insight? Uh -huh. Be the usual thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not nothing. Look, so here's the second most important thing, probably after the fact that the hierarchies are different. And I learned that from Martin Jones, the QML lead, like a year ago on Stack Overflow. <laughs> I was sort of, <laughs> well, crying for help, pulling my hair out and was just unable to get why this all works like it works. 
And I think the rationale here is uh, like this. The hierarchy we see on screen is the hierarchy as it will be, well, let's say, wired up upon the scene. Uh, sorry, when the scene is associated, right? And this hierarchy is actually not static, so we can actually reparent items. For example, this intermediate item can become a child of that one if we unparent the innermost one, right? So the visual parent-child hierarchy is flexible, it's dynamic, you can reparent items. You write your code as uh, some sort of CSS or JSON, but in fact you can play with the parenting in any way you, you would like. You can have null parents and so on. And this suggests, I think, that if the uh, scope and name lookup were or scope chains were actually governed by those initial uh, relationships, then it would mean that merely reparenting items or deleting, deleting some items would mean <laughs> the change the change in the actual values you get from uh, your bindings, right? And that would be even worse than it is now when most of people sort of only suspect how things work, right? So what they did here is, and let's look at the result. So we instantiate the scene and get this. Local is local for the function invocation. And name gives us A. So this one is found. And the rules are, let's go back to the rules. So the rules are these. We have IDs and we have names, right? And that's it. And then we have a document which serves as some sort of boundary and during the name lookup. And then we have those items which are initially, well, somehow parented to each other or maybe not parented. For example, if you create a property like for example, here, if it was not property string, but property item, and you had an item specified right here, that item being a value of a property would have no parent, right? So, not here. Scopes. There are ID, there are root items, and the rules are like this. So firstly, the IDs are looked for. Then if no ID is found, the enclosing items properties are searched. So here uh, you have this item, but it has no property named name, right? And then not the uh, closest enclosing item within the initial static uh, well structure of visual parents is looked, but rather the topmost one in the document. And if it's here, it's okay. If it's not, uh, the lookup continues uh, until it reaches the global scope. And that's it. Also, you should know that uh, components serve as documents themselves. So within components, you, have, you can have uh, here a separate set of IDs, and the lookup will reach component boundaries. And this item, for example, would serve as a, well, document root item in QML documentation terms once again. So this is all about documents and searching firstly ID within a document, be it an inline document specified by a component <laughs> definition or a normal document like here. Okay, we've covered it. Then, overloading. We will probably run any examples here, but the f most important fact to know here is that you can overload functions and they behave like virtuals in QML. So you overwrite something, even maybe on a per instance basis, and it behaves like a virtual functions, function. So you can have those template methods or whatever from system like languages. And you can effectively reintroduce properties, which means 
properties are not virtual in the sense. And maybe we are lucky that they are not because. And this is actually covered by the docs. So if you introduce a property with the same name as a parent's property, the bindings in the parent will work. But whatever actually uh, looks at the child with a new property on top of the old one, will actually find the new one. This is again simple to remember. Here we have some links. Now, a cool topic, uh, QML use. So sometimes the standard views just don't sort of cut it. And the usual problem is, for example, again, having scroll bars with the standard list view. And the fact is that the list view associates its items dynamically and it doesn't track the actual position of the visible area, right? So there is a problem. Dozens of guys sort of try to solve it, manipulating the properties of the view uh, or the flickable from which the list you inherits. And sometimes, at least in QML1, you just get crash. So you try to be too smart, and the list view actually manipulates the values itself, and then it blows up. So <coughs> what actually should be done here? And let me reach for some example code. So the idea here is is to use, and this is QML1 code actually, but QML2 will be just the same. It just will be QQuick context and so on. It's, by the way, quite a nice thing that all the knowledge you actually gain while working with QML1 actually pertains to QML2 and vice versa. So for example, if someone has a long going project which is still cute for 0.7, 0.2 or something, all this still applies. You just have to make the obvious changes or have things in mind. So the idea here is that we create something named context. And context is just the same scope boundary as we already seen with, with the documents. And that's it. Within that context, we instantiate our delegates, or specifically one delegate, and we set the data we get from model on top of that context, so that, that uh, the role names for the model are actually accessible from within, within the delegate. It works like this if we run the test file. Let me see. OK. Oh, sorry. I should have made it an active project. OK, so here must be my, my visual test. I have some items, and they are instantiated dynamically as I move the window. So that's almost the same thing uh, uh, that the list view does. I basically know the geometry of my item stack, right? And I specify the window size. And let's imagine that the user scrolls the view like this, and this window actually stays at the same screen position, but the actual items get created and deleted, as the log actually suggests here. So that's what happens there. And on the inside, there are those QML contexts or scope boundaries created. The values from the model are set on them, and the delegates are instantiated within. The next example. Let me see. Also, already features a scroll bar. So this is a QML scroll bar I created. You see, it's nice. It works. If you scroll a little bit, it just recreates the necessary items and then shifts all the remaining ones, which should still, uh, which should still stay on the screen. Or if you move it really fast, it has actually to delete all the items from the previous, well, let's see, visible window and create new ones. And here we have the numbers numbers of items, so it's like 100,000 items, and it works. So simple delegates, but that's it. It's normal scroll bar, so it's the <laughs> holy grail of, yeah, question. Can you still flick the... Uh, yeah, following the natural uh, 
sort of path of criminal development, I utilize the flickable just as the standard list view does. <laughs> and actually, we have this in the slides. So, go, tricks, treats, switch into the C site, cache and answer data, do binary searches using contexts, and okay, this one is important here. Make your delegates invisible in your custom views when you are going to delete them. And then call delete later. Because, for example, if this happens from within an on-click handler, you will get a crash. So it's not like com, where, like com, I mean Microsoft com, where you can have at the very bottom of your function something like delete this. Here it will not work. Cumul still will do, do something behind the scenes and you will get a crash. So just use delete later. Yes, and Flickable is your friend, so use Flickable. And everything else can be written in QML. So scroll bar, for example, here is fairly simplistic. It's like the logic is not a trivial maybe, but it's like 150 lines, quite simple. OK, further. And we have like 5 or 10 minutes before the questions start. Keyboard and mouse input. So the goal here is to be confident with the keyboard focus. And their uh, focus, active focus, uh, the concepts of uh, focus scopes, and the like things. And also the enable property, as you probably know, and this all is sort of intermixed in different fashions. So the tricks here are maybe just go crazy, test everything manually, or be smart and use squish. Or maybe just do some time-driven time checks and force things. By the way, this thing doesn't apply to QML1, probably, because in QML1, focus is broken. So guys, there is no hope, I think. So if your project is QML1, binding to focus or active focus will get you your handlers not called. There are two bugs for both cases, one filed by me and one by other guy. And Maybe they are fixed in QML1 for Qt5, but uh, that good old QML1 for Qt4, <laughs> you just to, uh, you, well, you have to just f find the combinations of uh, nesting and parenting where the handlers do run. So keep in mind. And the treat here is, yeah, the focus property is fa false by default, and you should expect it. Uh, or maybe the active focus to change only upon scene, see the scene being loaded. And then we cover some topics related to invisible items and disabled items, and they behave somewhat differently. But the thing is, it's quite hard to remember this all. And thus, we have a visual tool, quite ugly, but handy. And it will be in the sources available online. And the tool is here. This sticky board, focus chain demo, okay, okay, trans. So my idea was to create the hierarchies of items visually like this. These are the children, and now I can add a focus scope, right? And now some children to it, okay? It's flickable again. So I can set focus. And red means focus, and uh, border means active focus. And I can also, for example, do this. So you see, this still has active focus, and this has focus. I can change focus here, here, and if, for example, I set focus here, what happens? This one gets active focus. So this is a nice thing to sort of, uh, well, figure out uh, the correctness of your assumptions regarding focus and focus scopes. Because sometimes you would like, you would think that, for example, no two items could have active focus simultaneously, but that's not true. Here we see that two items ha have them, the, the, the active focus, Bo both the parent focus scope and the focus, the actual focused item. <coughs> so the advice here at least until this ends up in the internet or you actually maybe get it from me, just check your assumptions because sometimes things sort of get tricky here. And we can ch check for behavior of disabled items and uh, hidden maybe here as well, I think. Okay, 
Next topics. Tricks. Ah, input emulation. So this is something which is also asked for in forums quite often, and often the suggestions are sort of not that good. And the solution here is, OK, we're almost done. Firstly, use something named oh, QGUI, isn't capitalized. OK, QGUI application focus object. And it can be zero if your window is out of focus. So if you fired up a QQuick window, then I'll tap to another window and then call, and this somehow got called, for example, in an on timer event, right? You will get zero. So check for it. And then you can use either QQuick window send event or QGUI application send event, and it will work. <coughs> so this is something to use with virtual keyboards and so on. You can send delete case, backspaces, whatever, to standard items, and it will work perfectly. We have actually some examples on this with <laughs> text sort of being uh, interactively added uh, to the standard items without the user actually pressing anything. Now, the last thing, and the mouse tricks. So speaking of the mouse, and we are almost out of time. Um, Sometimes, for example, when you have several items hovered, uh, sorry, when you yeah, when you have several items hovered and they are already stacked, you have the, that, that problem that you would like to maybe register the hover event in all the items. And here is probably no clean solution until something is implemented by the actual QML developers. But there is some sort of a trick this time. So you can, at least we do this sometimes, in our projects, you can check the mouse cursor yourself and then have a little specific item, probably descending from the simple QML item, which basically says whether the cursor is within the <laughs> items area. And this allows you to have however uh, high or deep stacks of items, and they all will report however properly. So for example, if you have one of those list view applications and you would like to have a row which reports hover or gets some glow effect on it, maybe, and then a picture on top, and you would like it to also be highlighted when you hover. This is one of the possible solutions, I think. And lastly, styling. And, uh, and suggestion here is you can use the import mechanism for styling. Just use separate sets of modules for different, let's say, uh, styles, maybe platform styles. And this actually works quite well. For example, you can have one set of modules for Windows styling and another for Linux styling with different fonts and colors and so on. And then upon the application being fired up, the specific uh, paths uh, get added with the add import path and it all works. It probably will even work dynamically if you recreated the whole view, keeping the backend uh, uh, in the same state it was uh, prior to the view recreation, but that would require probably having some view state kept in the backend. I believe some guy is giving a talk about uh, nicer ways to style applications and change the styles during runtime, either today or maybe it was tomorrow, or yesterday, sorry. So that's it. Thank you. If you guys have questions. OK, Vladimir, I don't know about the rest of you, but it's very dense and lots of questions, I'm sure, from that. So we'll start over here. Hi. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, a question about your uh, scroll bar, as you can ah. imagine. Um, so if you, what I understand is if you drag the, uh, the slider in the scroll bar, you are changing the content one. Yep. And that, exactly. that means the, the list view uh, gets moved. But if you move the list view, you are again changing the content Y, and you want the, the slider at the right percentage in, in the scroll bar, and so you basically have uh, something like a loop. Ah. How did you fix that problem? Sorry. And that's the actual uh, sort of example of what uh, this section was about. It's not a standard list view. It's a custom view item. It's a custom view. Yeah. It creates its own delegates on the C++ side with those contexts and so on. So that's the, the actual answer to all those problems with the 
circular dependencies and list view and list view manipulating uh, content while, while you're doing the manipulation yourself and then you get a conflict and it crashes. Yes. So the solution is to write your own. It has some issues as well. You have to check all the model changes or maybe track them in the most simplistic way, like bind all the model change to signals like insert, move, and so on, and then just redraw everything on screen. And sometimes th this will be fast enough, and sometimes probably not, but yes, thank you. Uh, hi, um, mm -hmm. you put a lot of uh, energy in your examples, also in the lightning talk yesterday. Would, will you make them uh, available online, all your examples? Yeah, of course, sure. And the lightning talk code will probably get a little bit improved, and yeah. I hope that we get something to the next dev days, either in short or long. Will long that be on the dev days homepage, the, the examples? I believe so, yes. All right. Cool. Thank you. After the San Francisco dev, dev, dev days end, we will have all the source code and the slides available, I think. But you can always contact me sort of personally. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, I have four buttons on uh, QML GUI. Mm -hmm. And I want to assign a global keyboard shortcut to each of those buttons. So how do I do that? Uh, sorry, the buttons and the signing. Uh, what what's so it's a rectangular area with the mouse. Mouse it's a rectangle with the mouse. So I have four buttons uh -huh. on a QML GUI. Uh -huh. So in Q widget, it's easy to assign a uh, keyboard shortcut to activate the button. Ah, the shortcuts. Yeah. Well. That's, well, we can actually discuss this after the session, but uh, I believe there is a f fairly standard way to do this. And as the keys get propagated from, in this case, visual child uh, to visual parent, you should properly set your focus, f probably, well, on the root item, right? It seems, and maybe, be just done with it and watch for the actual key sequences there. So in the root item, which sort of hosts all of your four buttons, you have the conditional logic, which in and on key pressed event looks for specific shortcuts. And then if it finds a shortcut it cares about, it activates the specific button. So it should be fairly straightforward. There may be some issues if you would like to sort of have several like items on screen and then you should properly indicate which one actually has focus now, you see, because it will work okay, but the user can actually get confused because they all look, they all look the same and just one of them has focus. That's it probably. Um, uh, yeah, you said something about the uh, solution for the hovering of a mouse area. You said to create an item that would track the mouse. Yep. Could you explain how that would work? Well, in the project where we actually did it, it was uh, firstly QML4 and, uh, sorry, Qt4 and QML1. Now it's QML5 and QML1, and we will be soon porting it to QML2. But there it was quite simple. We were tracking for mouse events, I believe, on the, what the QML view is behind the scenes, that all thing the predecessor of the QML, <laughs> QML graphics view, right. We were taking for, we were specifically hooking uh, into, well, the event processing uh, sort of pipeline, getting the mouse events, and then we were also initially getting the uh, position of the cursor, and that allowed us to, at the moment, know where the, the cursor is. And then you have the item, it knows its geometry, it watches its changes, and then you basically can write simplistic QML, which just uh, checks whether the cursor is <laughs> within the item. And you can, yeah. But now there's a different uh, hierarchy, right? Of the, in QML2, you don't have the graphics view. Of course, and that's the question, how, how you do it in QML2. But somehow you must be, of course, be, uh, be able to hook there and get the mouse movement. I am not sort of advocating this approach as well. <laughs> that very recommended, but it works. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks. Right, do we have any other questions? No, well, all right then. Uh, just okay. remains to thank Vladimir once again for thank his you. Uh, very informative talk. <laughs>